Chapter 16, the Renaissance, part two. Okay, so we're still in the high Renaissance and we um, are here for a bit longer. Here we are with Michelangelo. I just wanted to point out too that this was cleaned as well around the time, the year 2000, um, for the millennial celebrations. And it is brighter and again, some people have objected. All right, Raphael is another painter of the Renaissance. This is Pope Leo X with two cardinals. This is oil on wood. And oil painting, um, now fresco does have good depth of color to a degree, but oil painting is where um, a lot of depth and detail gets achieved, is achieved because it is workable for a longer period of time. Fresco is very difficult. The pigment is just suspended in water and it's worked into the wet plaster really quickly and it's stuck there and you can't really paint over it all that well. So all to, more to the point why um, Michelangelo is so incredible doing this giant fresco for many, many years on his back, for crying out loud, on scaffolding at the top of the ceiling. But we are here with wood and uh, oil on wood and oil painting is greasy and it takes a long time to dry. It's basically linseed oil and pigment. And um, a painter could come back repeatedly and keep layering and layering and layering color. And just look at every fabric fold, every reflection. This is like a beautiful satiny fabric. He's got on kind of a velvety looking satin. Um, just all that brocade, all that detail, just absolutely stunningly gorgeous. We are focused on, um, you know, religious figures, of course, like we would be, um, but we also get into some other um, allegorical type paintings. Giorgione with the Tempest here. So this is the Florence style, um, and we are oil on canvas. So the shift to canvas around this time during the Renaissance in the early 1500s, it, it helps um, transport, uh, make the artist able to transport the piece because there's stretcher bars. I don't know if you know that much about canvases, but you have it suspended on a stretcher bar. So there's these pieces of wood behind the canvas that are just stapled together or hammered together, and the canvas is stretched over it. It's very easy with an oil painting on canvas to take it off of the wood, uh, roll it up, and then transport it somewhere. If it's on, a painting on wood or stone or anything like that, or a fresco for sure, it's not going anywhere. A painting on wood could travel, but you got to be really careful. It can crack, but the idea of oil on canvas was helping things travel more. So artists could paint more paintings and sell them to a variety of people um, in different countries even. They could commission things while they're traveling. So this appealed to the merchant class more. The uh, artists no longer have to be in the court of a king or um, working directly for the pope. They can make various other artworks here. Titian, the Assumption, another piece, just a lot of depth of color, very, you know, just gorgeous rendering of fabrics. So this is where it is. So m many of these paintings, like I'm saying, is the, the point of it, its existence is educational and it would be in a church and not a movable piece. So once this piece was created, um, it would stay where it was. It wasn't meant to be viewed necessarily by outsiders. It was sta it was stationed in one place. It did not travel. All right, so we get in the Northern Renaissance, so it's look going to look a little different. So it has some visual differences, but still we're in the Renaissance, and it goes a little longer, um, starts a little later, goes a little longer, because most of the activity is in Italy for the Renaissance, okay? We were in Rome and we we're in Florence. Um, so the Limburg brothers, Van, Van Eyck, Grunewald, Hans Holbein the Younger, and Durer are just a few. Now those guys are also multi-talented, especially Durer. He comes up with typefaces, he does printmaking, he does painting and drawing, he's amazing. So their interest in detail stems from um, decorative arts, like illuminated manuscripts that we saw in the Middle Ages, and stained glass and tapestries. 
They're interested in precise outer appearance of the subjects, and um, their religious artwork tended to be more harsh, not loving or sweet, but just kind of uh, stiff. So this is interesting, these Limburg brothers. This is a calendar. This is one of the first sort of painted calendars. But the but the most important thing about this piece is it's the first depiction of snow in painting that we know of anyway. But um, previous to this, and this would be February 1416, um, it's sort of more of an illuminated manuscript than it is a... A, a true painting, if that makes sense. Um, and it doesn't say the materials, but I'm going to say this might be uh, gouache or... Um, hmm. I don't see it. Okay, so this guy um, that we're seeing here is a is sort of a realistic-looking, funny little figure, and he's walking up a, a hill, and we're seeing some life slice of life this is called genre painting, where they're just painting about life. Previous to this, of course, we have religious scenes and we have uh, royalty being painted. So this is unusual in that way as well, because we're showing, we're seeing these people on a farm doing their thing. This guy's looks like he's chopping down a tree, and there's some birds feeding on some seeds and, and the flock of sheep. And here she is in her heater. Now this wall's been pulled away so we can see inside. She's warming her feet and legs, and she's pulling her skirts up for crying out loud. Oh my heavens, what a scandal. So in this case, seeing the snow in a realistic place, um, that was unusual. It's a slice of life. That's also unusual. The reason that you wouldn't have seen snow previously because you were always depicting times of the Bible, and the Bible's in the desert. So there was no snow depicted. Now we're starting to depict our own lives, our own events, and we're in that sense of humanism. This uh, Van Eyck portrait, double portrait, very famous painting. There's a lot of symbolism here. I don't want to get too caught up in that, but notice that you can see like every hair on his fur coat here in the lining there. And the dog, very detailed, her fabric, drapery, every fold there. There's actually a self-portrait of the artist reflected here, very, very small. But look at that mirror, it looks really realistic. And you can look at close-ups of this, it's, it's really incredible. We have a single light there for uh, the single candle there as a symbol of Christ's presence. Um, and this is supposed, this might be a wedding portrait, we don't know. We also think it could be a um, memorial portrait that this woman actually died, and this was his first wife, and he wanted to commemorate her. Um, the other thing is that they think that this is showing her as wanting to be pregnant as opposed to actually pregnant. She's pulled up a bunch of cloth to make herself look pregnant. They're near a bed, and then um, they're hoping to be with child very soon. So that's the idea in this in wedding portrait. There's a church out here. You can't really see it from this small of an image. But w the idea that they are married in their bedroom, but they are on holy ground because they're in view of the church and they have their shoes removed, which means that um, there's respect because he's in a holy place. Many, many more symbols. You can read more about this if you look into the book, but also there's other resources on this. But we're not really sure exactly what this is. Some say it's a marriage certificate or a marriage um, commemoration. Some say it's his first wife. Okay, oil on panel. Now this is often shown as one of the first oil paintings. And this is a portrait of a man. So a portrait of a man. Oh my goodness, it's no one specific. It's not an important royal figure. Um, so that's, um, that is groundbreaking right there, but the idea that he's going to paint all this beautiful detail, uh, rich color, um, that gives him more time to do this with oil paint. So that's 13 inches by 10, a little bit bigger than a size of paper. So this is also Van Eyck. So you can see there's a little bit of a difference here. This gets into a little bit more realism than our previous piece. Hans 